Ben. Victor Björn. Oh So I'm uh, Victor Björk, <laughs> as I said, but uh, I'm a biology student and uh, I'm uh, very interested in aging and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, super centenarians in this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, but I, I, I want to start first with saying that uh, uh, I will explain during this uh, uh, lecture why I think the first 130th birthday will be a very important event in the history of humanity. Uh, and I also want to explain what a super centenarian is, and that is a person who is well over a hundred. Okay. Super what? So, what is what is aging? Oh, I thought super saiyan. Well, aging is the failure of the body to repair itself, so it's not a developmental process like uh, puberty. It's not something that the body aspires to do. It's simply the, the uh, accumulation of different uh, uh, problems in the body that are related to its normal functioning, so it's an intrinsic part of, uh, of living. So as you can see here, so you can also define uh, aging in uh, different categories, for example DNA damage, as you know uh, the body repairs itself, uh, it repairs its DNA every day, uh, but that process is not perfect, so you end up with DNA damage and you uh, also end up with epigenetic changes. Uh, for example, uh, we are not only our genes, we are also our interaction with our environment, which is epigenetics, and uh, that changes with age. And we have telomere shortening. Um, you know, probably Elisa Blackburn won a Nobel Prize that the telomeres on the chromosome, they, they shorten with age. We have cell senescence, cell that, cells that uh, simply don't function anymore. And we have loss of uh, proteostasis, for example, uh, which means that uh, the uh, degradation versus production of protein uh, changes with age and that uh, leads to the accumulation of, of different uh, protein-related problems in the body, uh, such as Alzheimer's and amyl amyloidosis and, and so on. And you have stem cell de depletion, that stem cells run out, and the deregulated nutrient sensing, for example, uh, which makes uh, a lot of people insulin resistant, for example, with increasing age. So, there is no such thing as a healthy aging process. There, there's this common myth that you can age uh, in a healthy way, which is, and I understand the appeal of thinking that way, because uh, of course it's more desirable to, to avoid certain age-related pathologies, uh, such as Alzheimer's, for example, and live to 110 instead of 80. But ultimately, aging, which is the accumulation of damage and healthy, they are deeply opposite to each other. So, uh, so what you observe when you see an old person is essentially a scar of metabolic waste. So uh, it doesn't make any sense to, to, to talk about healthy aging because uh, the tissues of an old person do not behave in a healthy way. And here you can see until mid-30s, uh, essentially mortality is almost uh, uh, identical. It's almost it's extremely low and it's mostly to accidents. And then uh, at about mid-40s, 45, it really starts to, to go, go up. And of course, all the cancer and heart disease and diabetes and so on are, are directly related to aging and would not happen if we were all biological below 45 or so. So, so and this uh, puts a major challenges, of course, on, uh, on uh, society. Uh, because right now we, we have 40% uh, of 85 year olds who have dementia. And uh, uh, that's from a cohort where uh, they still have very high mor child mortality in Europe, so it's it's not going to be easy when we have 40% of the people born during the 1940s who who all have dementia because that's a gigantic cohort, and you, as you can see, it's it's constantly I increasing, uh, and it's a major problem. And we are not going to solve this by, for example, working until 75 or so because. Uh, the amount that we pay in pensions is, is actually very little compared to what we pay in uh, healthcare costs for the last years of someone's life. So that's something I have been working on during this year. I published a paper earlier this year in the, the journal Frontiers in Genetics about the importance of classifying aging itself as a, as a disease. Uh, and not as a, a benign process that just happens accidentally to create diseases. Can we give you an applause? Oh, yeah. 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 Awesome. 
So I'm going to let you know what, the, what is a superstenarian, and that is a person who have uh, lived to over 110, and uh, uh, they are very uh, uh, unusual. You about one in 50,000 people born uh, 110 years ago have lived to to become a supercentenarian, and about uh, uh, one in 700 centenarians live to to 110. So it's a very high mortality rate there, uh, and about one in 80 babies live to 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 100. So they are the slowest aging. And, and therefore the healthiest people around that uh, finally end up becoming this old. And the uh, predictor, for example, of becoming a supercentenarian is uh, that they are often able to live independently and, and walk uh, at the age of 100. And of course uh, that indicates that they function much better for longer. Uh, because most centenarians are in their last year and extremely frail. So they, they seem to age slower, not just avoid disease. But there's a, a little problem here. Uh, you people have been validating supercentenarians, uh, verifying their birth records, uh, and so far there there is about 2,060 verified people over 110, and that is of course not the whole world. It's not China and South America and so on, but it's still a very significant fraction. And as you can see, there's half of the people who reach 110 are dead at 111, and half of the people reaching 11 are dead at 112, and the, here you see the mortality even accelerates. So out of uh, so 98 percent uh, of people who live to 110 are dead in five years. And They're all fucked. Yeah, <laughs> and, and one person lived to 122. So so it's a very difficult way to go. Yeah. So uh, and the reason for why uh, extreme longevity, like becoming a supercentenarian, is extremely uh, unusual, is because uh, uh, evolution optimizes for reproduction and not longevity. The genetics that lead uh, to the level of repair, uh, that leads people to age slower and avoid the disease and live to over 110, that is not the same genetics that produces an advantage early in life. For example, you could imagine a few thousand years ago, uh, you had one woman who was, for example, very resistant to disease, she was, uh, had symmetrical features, long legs, uh, curvy, everything like it, that a Stone Age guy would find at attractive in that way. But that she might be prone to developing a cancer in her 50s or 60s. And then you have uh, another woman who might not be very fertile and she has asymmetric facial features and she's not considered attractive and she doesn't have a very well functioning immune system early in life but she has the potential to live to 115. But uh, the, obviously the woman who is going to live to 60 under protective uh, circumstances is the one who wins because she, she succeeds in uh, passing on her offspring. So the person who would have lived to 115 was the loser from an evolutionary perspective. It's only in our society that we are this well protected that such genetics would come to an advantage. Peter, yeah. is, is this well established and according to which theory was that? Yes, I, I will explain. So, I think it's very well established. Okay. <coughs> Uh, so, what drives super longevity? Well, the most uh, we have uh, uh, several different factors in genetics. The strongest, I will say, is uh, lipoprotein metabolism. You have uh, the ApoE mutation and the ApoLipoprotein A myelin mutation, uh, where you, where a lot of people in northern Italy, for example, reach an extreme age. And you have the FOXO3A and the immune system mitochondrial adipocyte, and you they often have low levels of growth hormone. Uh, and they tend to live longer. But this, uh, this applies only to centenarians because we have still not succeeded in finding a genetics that, uh, that uh, makes people live to become a super centenarian because they're also very unusual and uh, we have not seen any common pattern in, in these people. So, now I take uh, 30 seconds, one minute pause, and you are going to discuss with each other or think for yourself. Should aiding research first target all this old? Think about that for a little while. Yes. Precis då. Det är väl mellan 60 och 85 och de som dör. Så det är inte så att det är en val. Det är det Okay, I start again. Um, so, I need to think about this.
I will come to it later on. Uh, but what blocks progress on maximum lifespan? Because it's uh, pretty clear that uh, that uh, lots of people live to 110, but almost no one lives beyond 115. So there's some wall there that that uh, with an extreme death rate that doesn't ex exist at any other age. So uh, research is going on to identify what actually makes this extreme sharp limit. Why why don't we see the one person live to over 130 or something like that? Right now, human ignorance, right, actually, because I mean, well, if I, everybody would uh, be as enlightened as you, a lot of people would actually work on this problem and we would actually solve it, so right uh, now... Naturally, if we say naturally, well, why not to see any, I'm a 30-year-old just occurring by accident, but I will come to that. So, for example, uh, when, you, when it comes to established causes of death uh, in the subcentenarians, uh, we have one study where 12 subcentenarians were autopsied and 10 of them were found to have died from a type of cardiac failure due to uh, TTR amyloidosis, it's called. Uh, and uh, uh, that's uh, a, a transthyretin and retinol is a carrier hormone in the cerebral spinal fluid for uh, thyroxine, the, the, the hormone. And uh, with increasing age, something is going on, and it loses. It's a lots of proteostasis, lots of protein uh, uh, degradation, and so, and it gets stuck in the cardiovascular system. And these people develop heart failure, and they eventually uh, die of this. And the, this pathology is not found very often in in younger elderly people. But there is also, of course, a lack of uh, of. Uh, uh, studies generally on the oldest old because there's still this attitude that if an old person die that just happened naturally and we don't care about really autopsying if they, if they are over 90 and so on and we, we of course pay the price for that and uh, the reason for why amyloid ag aggregates in the body is because uh, uh, the amyloid fibrils that get stuck they are uh, lower in energy than the native state so it's a uh, thermodynamics basically and here you can see some pathologists, for example, in the brain and in the, in the, in the eye. And the, here you can clearly see that, the, uh, for example, TTR amyloidosis, it affects the heart and it affects the kidneys and it, uh, the, the major vessels there in the body. And there, that's where it gets stuck and it leads to, to heart failure and cardiac arrest. So, of course, amyloidosis is not the only problem of aging. There are many other problems as well, but this is the identified cause leading to, to the direct death of, of the oldest old. And uh, uh, for example, uh, in, in this heart, you can see there's a pretty severe fibrosis, a very pre, uh, severe tissue uh, growth, and, uh, and uh, that is a major cause of heart failure as well. And uh, you have a, a telomere shortening and a mitochondrial function dysfunction, which is uh, an important aspect of aging, but uh, it, uh, uh, it has not been linked in that sense to pathologies. We know that telomere gets shorter with age and that there is uh, mitochondrial involved in aging, but we don't know exactly how they translate into pathologies. So, so my, my proposal is our oldest old should be essentially pioneers with anti-aging biotechnology, because uh, uh, Right now, we see, we see all these people living to 110, to, to 115, and they, we don't see any progress. We don't see any people living naturally longer than this. And in order, the oldest person ever lived to 122, uh, and that was almost 20 years ago. So you can be very sure that that uh, uh, even with uh, uh, even during the upcoming decades now, uh, uh, in the absence of, of reju rejuvenation biotechnology, we will not see people naturally living beyond like 125 or so. So. If we see someone turn 130, we know that that person will have been uh, rejuvenated. We will essentially have defeated aging in order for that person to live that long. So the idea is, of course, that the, if you start to implement things in 70 years, you have to first wait very long until they succeed. Sean Carmon who lived to 122, and they can uh, prove that they are, we have really reached life extension. But if you implement these technologies in super centenarian, where they have nothing to lose, and if they live 50 more, more years beyond 125, 127, we know that, that we, we have a really defeated what is pos possibly to do naturally. Okay. Yeah. So advances, uh, of course, occur step by step. We are not anywhere. Could I just ask, yeah. whose proposal was that? Is it your proposal? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so advances occur step by step. Um, so we are not anywhere close to, to putting a 90-year-old in a, a reunion clinic and out comes a 20-year-old. But, uh, uh, but we uh, might be, be not that far from, uh, from 
uh, having having some therapies that might uh, uh, make the, the oldest old live slightly longer, and that is going to, to, to be the first step. So it's a bit like climbing Mount I Impossible. Here is the natural zone, and here is the, the impossible zone. And we will we in in order for us to experience ourselves the to see to see aging defeated in that sense, we must first target the oldest old in order to to see what can be done, what can be achieved with with the results. Because uh, the targeting a, a 60 or 70 year old is going to take so much uh, time until we have any any clinical evidence in. So these are my conclusions, as I said, uh, and I also think that seeing the records be broken, because now it's 20 years since the longevity record was, was set and it has not been uh, changed. So, so that is really going to be the major milestone of this century, I think, to, to see longevity records be, be broken. That is going to really stimulate further research that is really, really going to be encouraging to, to a lot of people. So, uh, and here is me and the second oldest person in the world, uh, 116. So, I felt pretty uh, pretty young. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. Woo! Woo!